Hello, and welcome to RRI Explained, a RESBIOS podcast. It is the aim of the RESBIOS project to embed Responsible Research and Innovation, or RRI, into four universities across Europe in the hope of improving the interconnectivity between science research and society, with a particular focus on the biosciences. But what is RRI exactly? Well, hopefully we can find out together. Today we are joined by Stephanie Okeo, a microbiologist and science communicator based in Kenya and the founder of Under the Microscope. Thank you for joining us today, Stephanie. Thank you, Christopher. So for our audience, could you give us a little bit of information about your background and what Under the Microscope does? So I originally have a scientific background in which I studied microbiology. Sorry, I'm going to get into a little bit of storytelling here. While I was working in a research institute, I discovered that most of the things or our work was not really understood by the public, or they didn't really understand the purpose of the research or even what the institution was doing. And this bugged me a little bit, because I think as a scientist, research is for people. That's the main purpose, apart from um, satisfying our curiosity as humans. And if we can't reach people, then we've already failed as a scientific community. So I moved from having keen interest in terms of research, being on the bench, to now connecting people to research and people also getting people interested in engaging and also contributing to science and moved to now science communication. And that's where Under the Microscope also came in. But when Under the Microscope started, it was more of representation in which I saw few people who are either female African on the YouTube space, particularly on the science education space. And I felt like there was no information online that I could relate to because there weren't people who looked like me. So the more I engaged and I delved deep into the matter of representation or creating content and also interacting with people on scientific work, I just noticed there was a big gap and there was a real need for science communication if you were to ever even advance science. And that's where Under the Microscope came in. So it's a nonprofit organization that leverages on education, social engagement and research and to advance science and innovation, particularly in Africa. I say particularly in Africa because that's where I know Africa is a big continent. It's not one country, but I feel the needs are mostly similar when you go to most African countries. And uh, it's a growing continent and a very young continent. And I feel if we talk of development, science and innovation is at the core. So that's where our focus is on. No, that's really interesting because last week I was talking with some coordinators from the ICGB who do quite a lot of outreach work in South Africa and Cape Town. And they were just talking about some of the challenges of trying to link up research institutes and science communicators from across the continent and the challenge of how big Africa is and how kind of diverse the well, the language is particularly, but also the people and the needs of the people there. So it's interesting that you are trying to reach out to the continent as a whole. Mm -hmm. And actually, Chris, you've also said something interesting. There are over thousands of languages, first of all, to start with. And then there is also cultural aspects to it. And culture, when when I think of culture, is people's way of living, just put it in a broad sense. That affects consumption of any information and that's why we're also very supposed to be keen on what are the cultural aspects of your target audience or your community and the thing is initially people have always focused on get the research done and then pass it to people but with modern society people have really become cautious in terms of what went into creating this how who was involved you know that people have become very cautious on the type of information they consume so this is also a keen factor to look at the type of how we were communicating 20 30 years ago is totally different with how we are communicating it right now and also how people are consuming that which is a big aspect for research because the main purpose of research is to for people to consume it and also for it to improve people's lives i always say and the planet that's the main purpose of research 
No, and that leads quite well with the idea of the REST BIOS project with RRI and reaching out to communities and making science a societal good rather than something that's just locked away in research papers or spoken about at conferences. And having this outreach of science linking with society and the communities that really need it, I suppose, especially now when we have so many quote unquote wicked problems that face society today and kind of the biosciences especially is kind of the crossroad to that. And I saw quite an interesting quote. So you have to forgive me if I don't pronounce it correctly, but you use the phrase Ubuntu on the website. And I was just wondering if you could explain why that phrase is so important to you. Oh, Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Ubuntu is one of our values where we are who we are because definitely the people around us. And it's more of if you look to any African society, it might have a different name, but um, there is that community and sense of humanity in which people are, we are who we are because of the people around us. And I feel science also is, if we put in science context, it's also built on that. We are able to study of other things because of the community around us and the people around us. And the moment we put science in a more humane manner, that's when it will start serving people. And I feel for anyone who is interested in using science for public good, you don't have to tell me that way, but Ubuntu has to be at the core of it. And right now we say people, but also I'm putting in planet because that also is a very big issue. Um, with the planet, we don't have people. <laughs> so those two also relate. But Ubuntu is just that strong sense of community and humanity. No, and I suppose it's quite dangerous to put humanity just in its own little box kind of disconnected from the world because obviously we've had a dramatic effect on the planet but also the planet drives our survival and the survival of everything else so sort of having that interconnected thought process of no we're not one species working independently we work with the planet and with society for planetary good I suppose. Yeah, it's just funny how we take things for granted and usually say a stupid person, person who has knowledge and does, ends up not using it. And we do know right now that we are burning our own house. And I think it's the aspect of science has played a key role in that. Now it's the point of executing and putting steps of, okay, how do we tackle all these challenges? So I feel it's always important, even when we're talking of people, the planet now, we have to drill it in our heads so that it becomes part of our conversations and our thinking process that it's not only people, but also the planet. Um, the two coexist. So the work that Under the Microscope does, it links science communicators and researchers within Africa and adds them to the context of STEM education, networking, public engagement, and of course the research they do. I'm just wondering if you could explain a little how Under the Microscope has approached these and some of the projects or collaborations that you're currently working on at the moment. Okay, so under the microscope, sometimes it's hard to explain even before like our, ourselves, we had a problem. And I'm talking this to tell whoever is doing science communication or trying to figure out what they're doing. It's okay not to know exactly what you're doing. So for us, it's a cocktail of things, but all of them related. So for our core points, I'm just going to bring this so that I bring in the projects. We look into creating networks public engagement, research and education. And at the center of it is science, innovation and people. Our past or our current collaborations, for example, is one that focuses on an online participatory research on science engagement and funding. So we do want to know what are the opportunities and challenges in science engagement, because this is a core community in terms of advancing research and, and science. This was very clear during the COVID, whoever doubts this. So we want, there isn't strong evidence in terms of what are the specific challenges. And also they vary with the region. And also, so there is a pool of people who already have insights. So through this insight, we hope to provide data in which can be used within funders and science engagement communities to um, make the funding space more inclusive. The other one we're doing is we're mapping out science engagement organizations or initiative. These are long-term initiatives. Because one thing, the amazing people doing great work, either, but we don't know where they are. 
And I always say, and I think this applies anywhere, sometimes it's not re reinventing the wheel because we're always sometimes doing the same things. I think there is, we should put in more effort in collaborative or nurturing collaborative efforts. So we want to know where are these people or organizations or efforts being put in and see, okay, where can we as a community assist each other? So we're mapping out um, science engagement initiatives and organizations in Africa. One can come in and submit an entry or even update an entry uh, in which you give a brief description of your project or organization, where you're located, and also a website link. For now, those are our two main, but we also started a, a new community called Creatives for Science. One thing we noticed over the years while doing under the microscope's work is we can't neglect the power that art has in terms of communication. So this is to bring about African creatives who are interested in advancing science for public good using narrative skills and also artistic skills. So you can be a, sing a sculptor, a singer, a filmmaker, whichever creative skill in this, and in which now we create a community where we do training and also work on projects that, that engage people. And for me, this is on the ground, how we make science inclusive. When you bring in other people to be part of contributing to build up of knowledge or also dissemination of the knowledge itself. So for now, those are our current active projects and previously worked on projects such as the FGM to STEM. So female genital mutilation to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Because one of the things also you have to look at is what are the cultural barriers? Especially when you work in different diverse communities, whoever, in whatever field, this is key. And for us, we felt for the female genital mutilation, we now know it's a harmful practice due to science, digging deep into now health issues, leave alone the social issues, first of all. And we saw, okay, how can we use science to bring about more empowerment and also use it as a medium to bring about such conversations and advocate for other alternative rites of passage. I think one mistake we do sometimes, especially when you're handling cultural sensitive topics, is we come in to say, this is not right. You know, you come in as somebody who knows it all. And I think it's to let people get there. You just act as a facilitator and also just see where you're able to support. I don't know if I'm becoming too philosophical, but I think for us in within research, if you look at key issues, sometimes it's cultural issues. One, that's one big major barrier. That brings me quite well to my next point, because as you say, it's one thing to kind of, and perhaps this has been science communication or outreach in the past where researchers and scientists come down upon high from their university buildings and say you're doing it wrong this is not what you're supposed to be doing and trying to enforce a viewpoint onto a culture that who has been doing this for hundreds of years perhaps and just steamrolling I'm not sure that's a word <laughs> steamrolling uh kind of people's thoughts and that sort of thing so I suppose yeah my question is how important is it for I don't know to get because a, a key kind of way that under the microscope does this outreach is by introducing role models into these communities and introducing people, introducing a face that like local communities can recognize as potentially themselves a little bit. So I'm just wondering how important that is for the work you do. And what are the other, has this sort of helped with some other roadblocks? Because obviously throughout the world, we're experiencing the issue of fake news, science mistrust. So I suppose, yeah, just having role models from local communities that they can relate to must be quite important for the work you do. Yes, especially if you're doing um, physical outreach sometimes. So I'm going to divide it because there's the virtual space and the things you need to, to be concerned with or with soft copy communication. And then now there is on the ground where there's physical outreach. And with the outreach for us has been to have like an ambassador or a role model or somebody well-known who has a voice within the community. And most of the time it's just not peak and speak is you need to interact with the people and know where they're coming from. Cause that's how you will know. You will not read it from, 
it's not something that you go and Google and you find it somewhere. You need to interact with people. You really have to interact with people. So is to know who is well known within the community. For example, with the FGM to STEM, and this was in partnership with several organizations, is they had to talk with the elders who have a, a voice within the community. With, with, with some, you have to talk with teachers, depending with the environment you're working with. So for us, role models are important because they re- represent the people. And also, it also determines the type of voice you have. And it feels now more receptive because people can identify with it. So role models is a key thing. And that that goes back to why even we started under the microscope. Representation is key. If people can't relate to it, people will not be recipient to it. It's just, it's human. And for virtual, for us also with the content, we're very keen, for example, to like we do some animations to have the characters um, black. Because sometimes for us, you find there's so much content, but there isn't representation. And that also kind of gives you, it influences how somebody consumes that information. So for us, even those tiny details of which language used, you know, the color, which is representation in terms of it's very keen. It's very important for us. But just to answer your question, I know (laughs) I can ramble. If you're doing outreach, you definitely have to because that's even how you'll know how to evaluate if your work is effective or not and i suppose that kind of links to the work you've done with combining the arts and humanities referred to now as steam rather than stem but i suppose having i don't know cultural links through artists or sculpturists or playwrights and kind of recontextualizing kind of the work that researchers are doing within their fields but presenting it in a different way that can be that can facilitate this sort of connection a little bit, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And also there is an advantage in terms of for the creative themselves, because we don't look at at one sided. We do feel these are mutual collaborations because there are many creative young people and arts in itself is an entrepreneurial industry. And science communication has not been such an explored space. Entertainment, fashion, those are areas that do have some footing. But science communication, most artists don't get into looking at it. Oh, this is an area that I can dive into and, you know, grow myself and make a business out of it. So that's also what we're encouraging our young creatives is apart from it doing for public good, look at it also from an entrepreneurship point of view. It makes you stand out and it's also still an unexplored field, especially within Africa. So it's a mutual benefit. No, it sounds like quite an exciting endeavor, kind of like a new frontier for creatives to kind of go into the science communication. It's something that's working baby steps in the EU, but there are projects that are dedicated to kind of this combination of science, technology and, and combining that with the arts. But I suppose, yeah, it must be a very exciting kind of prospect for young creatives in Africa. Yes, and actually also for the scientists, because I remember my first, one of the sessions I had was with music producer, and we were trying to do a voiceover, and he was like, Stephanie, so I had already written my script, and he told me, oh, you really need to cut these things. His question was, at the end of it all, what, what do you want that person to grasp? And then it hit me that I'm not simplifying my message. It's just that sometimes as researchers or as scientists, you're afraid now to, if you move too much from being scientific, you lose the content of or the weight of your information. But I feel that's the beauty of sometimes working with other people who are from the non-scientific community. Because what is the goal is that people understand what you're trying to say. And I always tell people, even in any project you're doing, what is the goal? What is the aim? And that should be your focus. So if your aim here is to maybe teach people on what a human papilloma virus is, simplify your message, know what people within your target audience interact with, and which mediums will be the best and how to put your message, which language to use, how often to do it, who should be your voice, should you be the voice or do you need somebody else? It makes you really learn about your people 
or community you're working with and also about yourself because it really improves your communication skills. I totally agree with that because yeah, just having, working within your little bubble within academia or research, you can sometimes get a little bit lost in the jargon, but bringing outside people in who can just sort of help you cut through the fat a little bit and just get to the core of what you want to talk about and yeah, just make your message clearer to as many people as possible. Yeah, that's why I think we, in any field, we're supporting an interdisciplinary practice because you need, you know, our, commu- our society has become complex. <laughs> I think that's the best way I could put it. There are many factors to dive in when you're thinking of communicating with people or even working with people. And it's not as simple as it used to be. Even there is the also aspect of sense integrity and also ethical aspects that I feel bringing in uh, the society or the public is very important so that we uphold the sense integrity and the ethical aspect of it makes us accountable actually, which is really needed with the type of in terms of the advancements we are having. No, that's a really interesting point just because ethics and kind of morality, it's a sliding subject and will always be sort of subject to change. But to maintain that kind of societal trust, you need to be, you need to ensure that your public and the people who this science is working for understand are on the same page about the ethics. Because yes, there's going to be some communities who are going to disagree with some research ethics, no matter what, such as, well, abortion rights, genetically modified foods, those sort of hot topics. But as long as you sort of communicate why and how you've made those decisions, it can sort of help bridge that gap between these researchers in their ivory towers doing what they want and not really explaining why or how or the benefit that that has. Mm -hmm. And also an important thing, I think, which we also shed light, was shed light with the COVID-19 pandemic is that also it allows the public to get into the world of research. Because it's not a one, two, three thing. It's not a straight line. And sometimes for people, it's hard to understand that. You know, one time you say, this is what we know. The next time, whatever you know has switched. But it's because there is buildup of knowledge. And it's frustrating also for the public when the vaccine was not understanding exactly the pandemic took time. And also the vaccine and all that. And it, it was like a failure by the scientific community. But it's also understanding that research takes time. It's a matter of failure and learning and build up of knowledge. And sometimes when people get that, people are more a little bit receptive and supportive. And I feel that's also very important because researchers work hard. People stay in the lab for hours. Some <laughs> live even almost live there. It, you know, people work really hard to come up and understand some different, within different concepts. And, you know, it is very disheartening when you get such responses because people are still human. But I think it's the aspect that sometimes we don't let people into this space to understand just how it works. And I felt that's the importance of role models, people just to come and understand, okay, what do these people exactly do so that they can get a life into or a lens into the life of a researcher. And I suppose that's why it's so important to do this public outreach, do this STEM education and introduce young people into this world of science and research and innovation, I suppose, and the work that you do in schools. Mm -hmm. And also the beauty of science engagement and outreach, because sometimes I feel people belittle the role of science engagement and communication. People think that all that work needs to go, first of all, just maybe into research and then dissemination of the product or service. But science engagement also bridges some gap when it comes to people with who are differently abled, people who there's language barrier. You know, those structural barriers that comes with ones that are influenced by different socioeconomic factors. So it's also one way of making sure that science is very inclusive because there are different people who have different target audiences and go to marginalized or vulnerable communities. And it, you know, where there was once no digital infra- infrastructure, now there is one because people see, okay, how can we make this or involve more of this community where people who are blind could not have access to some digital um, scientific information. People within science outreach look into how do we reach to these people. People even who are old, 
people in prisons. You know, you, you'll be amazed by different, so many science outreach programs that live that work with groups that we often leave out. So I think they really play a big role in terms of making science inclusive and, and living and reaching out to the marginalized communities. I suppose it's this sort of idea of equity versus equality versus just kind of leveling the playing field for communities with low science capital, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And I always say knowledge is power, but first of all, you knowledge is only power when you're able to use it, but you have to first have access to it. Um, so I feel communication plays a big role. I'm always like a big supporter of communication and doing what you're supposed to do as a scientific community. I suppose that kind of runs to my next question a little bit about, you mentioned before about the work that Under the Microscope has been doing, creating a network of science communicators and outreach professionals, but also links towards research institutes, both in Africa and internationally. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about sort of the shift away from kind of a Euro, Eurocentric sort of way of viewing research and kind of more democratizing that with a new, a more international lens and bringing forward African contributions to the research community? Mm -hmm. Um, That's a good question Um, because I feel globally we have been consumers of mostly um, science within or research within, not from the continent. And there is also this negative narrative that Africa is, is mostly a, co- a consumer of um, scientific knowledge and rather than a producer. <laughs> that is a whole debate on itself. <laughs> but I, I feel it's in time for us to have our own narratives um, within how we are building up knowledge within the scientific world and also how we are communicating it and also share best practices from our own experiences. Because first of all, best set up to know how to use minimal resources <laughs> in my case first um, and also how to work with very diverse people language wise first of all and also culturally and especially also how do you deal with barriers such as digital infrastructure because sometimes in even when i'm going to some sessions or discussing and brainstorming work with people within europe or outside africa we don't have the same issues because for example for us will be yes you've created like an online thing or an online program uh, but that's different might not work in some rural areas because there is digital infrastructure limitations so i feel our solution should be homegrown and show this whole narrative it gives us an opportunity to share best practices on how to use limited resources how to reach out to diverse groups and also support indigenous projects or knowledge, because I feel that's one aspect that Africa really needs to own. There is a lot of indigenous knowledge within this continent that needs really to be shared and can have a global contribution. And when I say science, I don't only speak of life sciences, applied sciences. I think we also need to talk of social sciences I know something that you were talking in the beginning, Ubuntu, then something that was within our community. So behavioral sciences right now is also very keen. So all the social sciences. So I feel it's something there is a lot indigenous knowledge when I talk of food, African foods that here right now people have been known for years to have benefits, but there's just no modern scientific input into it. For me, is just Africa has to start owning its narrative within the science and innovation space. No, that's a really interesting point, just because, yeah, there's so much information from these local communities, from these indigenous populations about potential like medicines that they've been using that, yeah, could be locked away if they aren't embraced by the scientific community. And if these communities are lost, that knowledge is lost with them, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And then also one aspect is also to bring in trust and support within research done within the continent. And this is how you do it, by supporting African scientists within the community and research with, from the continent. And that's how you get people to start supporting and also start consuming research from within. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes. No, I think that makes sense. Yeah. 
And I suppose you were talking a little bit about development of this network, but also within the context of COVID, that that this digitization of communication probably has helped Africa connect with within the continent of itself, really. Obviously, it also helps kind of bridge the gap between other international kind of research. But having that sort of infrastructure probably has been beneficial just for African networking, just because of the size of the continent and everything. Yes, I totally agree. And with the high mobile penetration and now uh, increasing internet digitalization has now given us access in terms of reaching out to more people, especially with Africa having a high mobile penetration and also increasing internet connectivity. And this brings in why young people are agents of change. And this is a great opportunity now with the digitization to reach out to more young people and engage more young people within this very important socioeconomic issues that surround science. So I feel that there is still a long way to go, but you have to start from somewhere. And this is a space that will continue growing. So I feel for science communicators, this is something to hope on. And just sometimes also be very realistic. If you're using internet and that's your main medium, um, I think you should see how to make it more inclusive. Can you, whatever you're doing, work offline? You know, does it consume a lot of data? You know, those small things are also sometimes very keen because we can be oblivious of those things. So how just do you hope on already whatever the structures and infrastructures that are existing? I suppose that's why it's so important still to do the in-person events rather than committing to all online or all, well, hybrid, because yeah, you risk still people falling through the gaps a little bit to do with connectivity or you still reach those communities even if they don't have yeah that internet connection or that access to a museum or something along those lines perhaps yes i totally agree the beauty of digitization is that it's made it's possible for us to uh, reach a wider audience and also at minimal resources because for example you just think of you want to host 100 people and you put the logistics about tight but with virtual you're able to do that I think we should always, there is still, it will never beat meeting people in person and interacting. And I feel if you're somebody who's really wants to get at touch of the reality, it's always good to see how do you do physical interactions where possible. So what do you see in the future for Under the Microscope? What projects have you got coming up that you're particularly interested or longer term than that? So for under the microscope, we, for, we see ourselves as facilitators. So we hope in future working towards making sure that we have more capacity building programs for other science communication or engagement initiatives and organizations within Africa. And also one key thing is how do we increase funding within this space, um, which is a major barrier in any, wherever you are. But I think for us, Africa is is a big issue because most of the funding comes from outside. So how do we facilitate funding within the continent for science engagers? And also how do we create more public spaces that people can engage with science uh, in whatever form this comes, depending with, with wherever you are, which community you're working with. So I think it's just more facilitation support already the existing work that is happening. So see ourselves more as as a facilitator uh, within this space in the African continent. Thank you very much for joining us today, Stephanie. Thank you, Christopher. The RESPIOS project is funded by the EU with the grant number 872146. To learn more about the RESPIOS project and the other pillars of RRI, please go to resbios.eu. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.